so tall, young, and handsome. Uh, but no, he's, he's feeling a little bit under the weather today, so I'm filling in for him. My name's Van Barnett, and I am a senior at LCU, so I'm glad to be here, and thank you for having me. If you all want to go ahead and stand, we can go ahead and sing out this song together. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Our shepherds kept their watching, for silent walks by night. Oh,
Let all 
Christmas is upon us this week as we approach. And I've been referring to the Christmas story recorded in Luke chapter 2, and I would like to read that section to you this morning of what we've been talking about. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it, were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I want us to think about what happened very first in this part of the story. When the angels, uh, angel appeared to the shepherds, they were terrified. They were afraid because the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were so scared. Every angel that appeared in the Christmas story, that was the response, fear. And when you stop and think about it, that was from the very beginning. When God appears in some form, there was fear because even Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they hid from God. And that is the effect sin has on us. We're afraid of God. We fear him. We think he's horrible. We blame him for everything. We deny him. We run from him. We hide from him. Until this night. When God sent his son into the world to take care of that sin problem. We now can call him father. We can call him our God. Because when you look at the Old Testament. So many people look at the Old Testament and think of a God of wrath. All these deaths, all these wars, all these punishments, which God said, if you sin, there's punishment for it. But what people miss is, whenever anybody repented, God's mercy and forgiveness was there. And so we see them offering the sacrifices to appease God, giving their tithes offerings to the priest, to the temple, to appease God. And God set this up in the law to help them understand what was coming but they were doing it out of fear. They worshiped out of fear. Today we get to worship out of the love God has sent. We get to give to God. We get to give our hearts, our minds, our souls, our all in worship to him in whatever way it is because of God's love. That's what Christmas is about and that's what we know. But there's still so many people in the world that look at God out of fear. And we need to be like the shepherds. We heard the story. We accepted the truth. We go out and tell people, and people can be amazed when they finally hear and understand there's a God who loves them, not out to get even with them, to harm them, but a God who loves them enough to send his son into the world as a baby to live a life like us 
to experience all the pain and the sorrow and the problems we have, but yet not sin, to be able to become the perfect sacrifice in death on a cross, to rise out of the grave to give us the same promise, and is preparing a home for us right now in the perfect place. That's our Christmas. So let's be praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story of life you've given to us through your son. And we just pray that we worship you the way you deserve, that we fully understand the gifts you have given us through your son. There are so many that sometimes we don't realize it. But may our eyes and our hearts open up those gifts in realization that we can live out the love you have shared with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Welcome to Substitute Sunday. Not only are we missing our pastor, but our worship minister, a lot of our tech team. But you know what? The great thing about this family is people step up. And everything just goes just fine. And I said for service, because I look over here and there's nobody sitting over here. And when I first started going to church, when attendance was down, for whatever reason, weather, sickness, whatever, somebody invariably would say, where is everybody? And I'm looking at myself, and I'm thinking, am I chopped liver? I mean, what, I, I'm here. And the great thing is, is I believe in what Jesus said when he said that we're Ever there are two or three gathered in my name, I will be there. So God is with us this morning. All of you online, good to see you this morning. I can't see you, but I'm glad that you're there. And by the way, uh, I, I did this before the last time Dave wasn't able to preach. Everybody turn around at the cameras. Find a camera, turn around, look at a camera. And not only to Dave and Melinda, but to everybody that's out there that's not feeling well, that's watching us online, and, and wave. <laughs> cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, as, as Lauren pro, um, pointed out, it is Christmas time, and we're finishing up uh, a series that Dave started a couple of weeks ago about the ugly sweater. And, you know, if I ask a hundred Christians, you know, what, what is their purpose? Why are you here this morning? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you pray? And I might get a hundred different answers. But there's only one right answer to that. And the reason that we are Christians and what we do is because of Jesus. You are not churchians. Just because you come to the Williamsville Christian Church and your name is on a book someplace that said you're a member of the church does not make you a Christian. Now, if I'm stepping on people's toes, it's because I'm stepping on my own toes. Because I was exactly right like that. When I first became a Christian, I was 12. And, you know, the preacher had, had preached these great sermons about forgiveness of sin and, and if you become a Christian... Your life is going to change. It's going to be different. But I misunderstood what he meant by a life-changing action. Because I thought that when I, and, and by the way, I grew up in a church that believed in baptizing you three times. And, and now, th th now that's what they told me. Now, I don't know if it was just me, and they thought I was really bad, and they needed to put me under three times. But, I, you know, I, I thought after that that, well, my life is going to be great. I'm not going to have any more problems. My acne was going to clear up. I was going to get the best-looking girl in school. I was going to have a nice car. I was going to get a great job. I was going to make a lot of money. I was going to be, you know, guess what? That didn't happen. 
at least not right away. <clears throat> but because the next day I did something wrong. And I felt terrible. I really did honestly feel like that my life had become an ugly sweater. And so as I have grown in my faith, I see the difference. And we're going to, we've talked about, Dave talked about um, ugly thoughts. He's talked about ugly words. Those things that we say and do, and I'm telling you what, I, li I like what he said because I grew up thinking, you know, that, that old saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I would rather you throw stones at me than use, bad wor use words that are hurtful because you cannot take back those words. And it's out of our thoughts that come those words. It's out of, that, out of our heart that causes us to say those things, to think those things. So today we're going to talk about the third part of it, and, and that's ugly actions. Because that's what I missed about being, becoming a Christian is that I didn't th realize that love, that life, is an action. It's not just sitting around in church on Sunday morning listening to a sermon. Because I'll tell you what, what I did is I went to church on Sunday but then I lived like hell the rest of the week. I missed the part where it says, if I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, my life reflects him every day, every moment, and everything that I do, everything that I say, everything that I think, I need to reflect Jesus. And so we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> You know, Christmas does a lot of crazy things to people. Whether it's gift buying, whether, and I, t I told this thing about my mom. My mom, <clears throat> she was great. She was the sweetest person in the world. And, um, you know, I'm a lot like her, so. <laughs> Shut up, Lauren. <laughs> but she, but the thing was, when we had, we had people over at Christmas time, every year, and I swear that she would get down and pick up the refrigerator and clean under the refrigerator because she knew that our guests would come and get down on their hands and knees and look underneath that refrigerator and say, oh my goodness, Jean, you're a terrible housewife. That's how she was. It, it drove her, it was crazy. Now, there's some pictures that I want to show you about what, look at that. Any of this look from here? My, another thing that my mom used to do was on Black Friday, they would actually go out to these stores, <laughs> take their life in their own hands to get 20 cents off of something. My mother drove 20 miles to save 8 cents on a pillow. Look at this. I mean, that's what Christmas does to some people. But it's the other side. It's what Christmas also does to some people. So we have two natures in our life. And we wonder, how in the world can that happen? How in the world is it that you take your life when you go into Walmart to buy a TV or when you sit at Christmas Eve service and worship? How in the world can that happen? Why? But it's true. We have a nature, and that's what I didn't understand either when I became a Christian, that my sinful nature was not going to go quietly. That Satan doesn't like it when you become a Christian. He doesn't like it when you worship God. He wants you to worship him. And even if you go through the motions and you go to church and you pray and you read your Bible, but you don't act out your faith, he likes that too. That's even better because then you're a hypocrite. And people are going to look at you and go, well, if Bob Anderson acts that way, I don't, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to be a Christian. If that's what a Christian is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So, we have a battle going on in us. We have the side of us that says, God is God, God is Lord, He is my Savior, He is everything to me, and then the other side of it that says, no, I am Lord of my life. 
I will do what I want to do. I don't care what anybody else says. I'm number one. You need to bow down before me. That's the battle that we have. And the Apostle Paul was always recognizing this, and he would write to the different churches that he had been part of, whether he started them or he, he sent people there to, to work with them. And one of those churches was the church in Colossae. And so he's writing to the, to the Colossians, and he's trying to get them to understand that as Christians, we cannot afford to live like the world. We cannot let the world tell us how to live. We need to reorient our life, get our GPS on the right path, and stick with that path. We need to shift from being ugly Christmas sweaters to something that we are supposed to be. The way God created us. It needs, our ugly actions need to become godly actions. You know, the Christmas, I don't know where it got crazy to the point where we've turned Christmas into a time where we were supposed to kind of just slow down, take, you know, reflect on the year, be thankful for the things that we have, you know, eat a lot of food, um, th th that kind of stuff. But why, why did it get to the point where we're, we're, like my mother, lifting up refrigerators to clean underneath of them or going to Walmart and taking our life in our hands to buy Christmas presents? The other thing is, you know, it, 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 the commercials drive me crazy at this time of year because th what they are telling us is that the, the amount that we spend on a gift shows the amount of love that we have. And if you don't want to put a car in the driveway with a big bow on it, you're a cheapskate. You don't really love your family. And I, there's a commercial now that I really love because it kind of pokes foot at this. One of these is that because you got this family and they're inside and the dad's all excited. He goes, let's go outside. There's something that I want to show you outside. And you just think, oh, it's another car commercial. They're going to go out. It's going to be a big red bow on this fancy car that they paid $80,000 for that they can't afford and they'll have to take back next week. But you go outside. They go outside and instead of a car in the driveway, it's the Energizer Bunny. I love that. I think that's great because it just pokes a hole in the thing that says you have to buy an expensive gift in order to prove that you're a love, you love somebody. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, this story because <clears throat> it, it, it reflects on my misunderstanding of not only what Christmas is about but of what God's about. My mother and, and father, my, my mother was, I was about to say, she didn't work. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. She worked harder than my dad did. She just didn't get paid for it. So we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up, but we always had a full amount of presents underneath the Christmas tree. And, of course, me being the wise, intelligent, materialistic young man that I was, I would get down under the tree and count every one of the presents that had my name on it. And then I would count all the presents that my sister's name was on it. And if I didn't have at least as many presents, if not more, because I'm the oldest, I'm the, I'm the only son, I should have more. If I didn't have that, I was upset. Well, I thought I would grow out of that. I tell people I have terminal Peter Pan syndrome. I will never grow up. I refuse. But got married. My mom, one Christmas, bought my wife and I for Christmas. We got a set of dishes. And I'm looking at that and going, are you kidding me? You got me? a set of dishes for Christmas, and that's it? We still have those dishes, by the way, and they are great. It wasn't until my mom was on her deathbed, taking her last breath, that I apologized to her for being so stupid. Because she gave that present out of her heart, out of her love for us, my wife and I, not just for me, and I should have recognized that, and I should have looked at that, because 
But again, because I had become, my actions had become self-centered and selfish, I didn't recognize the great gift that I had. And some of us as Christians do the same thing with the gift that God has given each and every one of us. So people do crazy things at Christmas, but this is what Paul says that we should be doing. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. He says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all. What did I say? Do it all. Keep that in mind. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So how much of our lives need to be lived and it's reflected of Jesus? Good, you paid attention. But that's true. There can't be one thing that we set aside and say, that, you know, I'm going to keep this part over here for me, and then the rest of it over here I'm going to give to the Lord. No, that, our actions in everything that we do, and I'll say this again, and you're going to hear me say it again the rest of our time together, is that all of it, all of our lives, not just a part of it, not just on Sunday morning for an hour or small groups or whatever it is, it has to be all of it. Because otherwise, we are being hypocrites. We're telling the world that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that he is the reason for the season, that he is why I am who I am, and then we're not, we're not living it. We are talking the talk, but we're not walking the walk. Those two have to go together. So living the way that, you know, that not just at Christmas time, and, and that, th- this is what I want to emphasize. It's easy to talk about Christmas time and get all the warm fuzzies and, and we love each other and Merry Christmas and we hear the Christmas songs and we don't watch Charlie Brown Christmas and we go, ah, you know. Th- but what about the 26th? To a lot of people, December the 26th is you go back to Walmart, you take all those presents that nobody wanted and get, you know, get re- refunds. To a lot of people, that's all Christmas is. But what about January the 12th? You say, what is January the 12th? Well, it's a day. And it's a day that the Lord made. And we should be glad in it. We need to live our lives every day like it's Christmas. Because of the gift that we are given of abundant and eternal life. Those things don't come, and they didn't come cheaply. It costs the life of God's son. So the choice is yours and mine about how we're going to live our life every day in front of our friends, our family, our co-workers, everybody out there in the world, and even and especially when you think nobody's looking. How do we live our lives? It's like picking out an outfit. Now, I am not a fashionista. My basic wardrobe would be a t-shirt and jeans. So you guys are privileged this morning. I actually put real slacks on and shoes. I don't have an ugly sweater. And I thought about saying, well, I just put my ugly face on, but that's not good either. But I do care about the way I look. I do care about the, the outfits that I put on, and people are astounded when they find out that my wife doesn't dress me. I, I think I have got good taste. But that's the way our life needs to be. We need to choose what outfit we put on every day of our, of our life. Because when he talks about <clears throat> that we need to do everything to reflect Jesus, that everything that we do needs to be in his name because of him. Because he goes on and he says in verse 12 in Colossians 3, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And the word that, that, the the Greek word that's used in there for clothe is to actually put on. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but just think about if you got up in the morning and you went to work and you didn't put clothes on. That's just not right. 
And unless you live in a nudist colony, you're going to get up and get dressed in the morning. No one would think about, you know, otherwise, right? That just doesn't make any sense. It's the same thing with, with our relationship with God. We need to put his will and his word on every day. It needs to become, you know, you talk about habits. Habits, to some people, are negative. You can't have habits because they're bad habits. No, not all habits are bad habits. Some habits are good habits. And the good habit that we need to practice every day is putting on Christ. And putting on Christ means putting on these attributes that we're going to talk about here. And I'm going to go over each one of them. The first one, Paul says, is compassion. And compassion is not just feeling sorry for somebody. Because, you know, here's another thing. Watching TV, and this time of year, they run all these commercials, and they do this a lot of times anyway, where, you know, the dogs are out in the cold, and they're shaking, and they've got one eye or one leg or whatever it is. And, you know, I know why they're doing it. And it drives my daughter nuts because she says, well, what about the people that are starving? You know, I, have, I love dogs. But if it came down between a dog and my grandma, I'm going to take care of my grandma. But they do that for a reason. They try to make us feel guilty. They, 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 they put the word compassion in for guilt. Because they try to make us think that, you know, if you don't take care of that one, uh, one-legged dog, you're a terrible human being. But compassion is more than that. Compassion is more than just feeling sorry. It's the ability to see a situation from someone else's vantage point. We do a lot of assuming in our lives. We look at the way people act, the way they look, the way they talk, and assume that we know everything about them. But how do we know about them? How do we know things about people? Relationships. You cannot have a relationship without getting to know someone. And you can't get to know somebody unless you use the two things that are on the side of your head. Listening. Listening is one of the key things that we can do as friends, as family, is to listen. Guys, take this to heart. Your wife does not want you to fix every one of her problems. And I know people are looking at me like, what are you talking about? I've been married for 40, 44 years. And what I have learned is that my wife doesn't want me to fix her problems. Because, you know, as men, we are the hunter providers. We are the ones who take care of every situation. We're the Bob Vilas of relationships. We are the ones who can fix the world. But that's not what some people want us to do. They don't want us to fix their problems. They want us to listen. They want us to understand. They want us to care. And you've heard that old saying, they don't care about what you know until they know about how much you care. Right? That's the way it is. That's compassion. Looking at it from their point of view. We sometimes, I heard a joke the other day, I don't know where it was, but it said, you know, if poor people would just get a job, eat more, have a house, buy a car, they would be so much better off. Now that's, but that's, our assumption is everybody can do that. We live in America. So everybody should be able to do just like we do. No. No. We have to listen. We have to understand the situation and see it from their perspective. So we need to close ourselves with compassion. The second one Paul talks about is kindness. Kindness sounds like a simple word, but it's a lot harder to live out than it is to say it. Kindness is when we look for practical ways to help others. I said, I said this first service. I said, you know, I love Service Sunday. I really do. 
I dreaded it the first time I was asked to help because in my mind, I can't do anything. I am totally inept when it comes to those kind of projects. But I found out that I can move dirt and pick up rocks and I can do a lot of things that I didn't think I could do. And then I said something about, except I can't clean out my own gutters. I don't want to get up on the roof anymore. I'm too old to do that. And somebody, God bless them, afterwards has volunteered to clean my gutters for me. That's kindness. That's kindness. Looking for practical ways to help each other. And we need to do that, whether it's service Sunday or not. We need to find those. And that's one thing that this church family does. And I cannot say enough thanks and appreciation to the people of, the, of this family, how they help each other. And not because they're told to, not because they're guilted into doing it, but because it comes out of their reflection of Jesus, of what he's done for us, we need to turn around and do for others. Kindness can come down to just saying the right thing at the right time. I had somebody tell me one time that, you know, I just went, I went, it, it was at a funeral, and I just went past them and patted them on the shoulder. And they said that meant more to them than in any amount of words I could have said. Patted them on the shoulder. Kindness can come in different ways. It doesn't have to be spectacular. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be. The third thing is humility. Humility in this world <laughs> is, a, is a word that just doesn't mean anything anymore, people, because we are all taught that this is number one. I'm the most important person in the world. I don't care what you think. I don't care if you think you're important. You're not as important as I am, and you need to worship me. That means on the roads, in the stores, Wherever you're at, I'm better than you are. And we've forgotten what humility is. It's not really, and, it, and it's something different that you might not, you might think, sometimes we think that humility means we need to think less of ourselves. That we're, no, it's not, it's not about bad self-esteem. It's not about beating yourself up. Humility is looking at the other person and giving them credit for being valuable. Think about that. In this world, we're always beaten down. We're, always, we're put in pigeonholes. We're categorized all the time. Whether, you know, in, in, when I was in high school, you know, we had the jocks. We had the stoners. We had the popular people. We had, you know, and, and we had, you know, I was king of the geeks. So that's all right. I'm sorry. But we do that. We categorize people, even when we get to be adults. And nowadays, it's like, okay, I'm going to judge you by the color of your skin. Or I'm going to judge you by, by what uh, political party you're on. No, that's not humility. Humility is you're important. You're important because God says you're important. Because God created you in his image and recreated you in his son's image. That makes you important. And I am here to serve you. That's not bad self-esteem. That's not thinking I'm not important. That's giving you credit for being valuable. Because who am I to tell you that you're not when God sacrificed his son for you and for me? So we need to, and again, I want to make this clear too. It doesn't mean that you accept bad behavior. It's like with your children. You're not going to let your children do whatever they want to because some of the stuff that they want to do is dangerous and it could hurt them. So you discipline them. You don't punish them. You discipline them. Sometimes we have to use tough love on each other. And I appreciate it more when somebody says to me, Bob, you re I'm really concerned about what you're doing. I'm concerned about your life. I, I think this is what I can do for you, and we just need to help work this out. 
I'd rather them do that than let me go on my way and end up in big trouble. Tough love isn't always pleasant, but it's helpful. It's useful. So we need to clothe ourselves in humility. The next one is gentleness. This word comes from a word that that means controlled strength. And a lot of times, you know, when we think of, of strong people, you know, we think of the Incredible Hulk or, or Superman or whatever it is. They've got these big muscles, and, and they're strong, and they can tackle anything. They can do anything they want to, and we need to kind of be afraid of them sometimes because they are so strong. But what it means is, as Christians, we are strong. The reason that we're strong is because we have the Holy Spirit. It's not anything that we've done or can do, but what God does through us. And so that makes us strong, but it also doesn't make us judgmental. A lot of people say that's why they don't want to be a Christian because Christians are always pointing fingers. They're always judging me. Well, they're right sometimes. Christians can become very judgmental, but that doesn't make it right, and that doesn't make, the norm, make it the norm. As Christians, we are to love everybody and be gentle with them, even if we are exercising tough love. We don't have enough gentleness in our world. We're too, cl- too quick to accuse. We're too quick to assume. We're too quick to do things because I, sometimes I think it makes us feel better. And I tell that to, to, to my friends and my family. When somebody makes fun of you and tries to put you down, all they're trying to do is they're not really trying to hurt you. They're trying to make themselves feel better. Because they can look at you and say, hey, <laughs> at least I'm not you. At least I'm not doing the things or saying the things that you do. But that's not gentleness. Our gentleness is expressed in service to the weak and to the powerless, those who cannot defend themselves. doesn't describe a wimp. I don't think I'm a wimp. I may be short and fat and old, but that's okay. It doesn't make me a wimp because God makes me strong no matter what I look like. And the last, the last thing that Paul says that we need to clothe ourselves with, to passion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and then there's patience. (laughs) I love it that he always leaves this thing at the last. You know, of all these things, you know, I can look at it, well, I can be compassionate, compassionate, I can be kind, I can be humble, I can be gentle, but (laughs) don't ask me to be patient. When I was a youngster, I could not wait for Christmas because, again, I was going to get a lot of toys until I got a set of dishes. But we are called to be patient, not only with circumstances, but with people. You know, I can't help it. I wish I could say that every relationship that you have in your life, nobody is ever going to irritate you or aggravate you or disappoint you or discourage you. I wish I could say that, but that's not true. We live in a real world. There are people who are going to do all those things, and sometimes all at the same time. But we are to have patience. Sometimes it's translated as long-suffering. It simply means that we need to put up with life, even if the circumstances are negative and the people around us are negative, and we have to struggle with it. Think about all the abuse Jesus took. I'm not just talking about on the cross. I'm talking about his daily walk even sometimes from his own followers because they didn't want to understand what he was, who he was and what he meant. You know, Peter denied him three times. Peter Peter told him, no, we're not going to let you, you're not going to die, you're not going to do this. No, 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 no. And he said that not out of love or concern, but he said it out of selfishness. He didn't want Jesus to leave. Patience means that we hang in there. It allows us to love people that are hard to love. 
and even harder to serve. The key to spiritual maturity, to living the life of a not an ugly sweater, but having positive, beneficial, useful, loving actions is to have these aspects that we just talked about. And it doesn't come overnight. It doesn't happen just like that. And I, again, going back to when I became a Christian, I thought it did happen just like that. It doesn't. Christianity it's not just a destination, but it's a journey that you take one step at a time, one day at a time. And the last thing I want to leave you with is the fact that these actions that I've talked about, of all the things that we are to put into practice, love is the big thing. It overrides all these other things. If you love, if you have the love of God in, in, in your life, then all these other things, the compassion, the gentleness, the humility, the patience, it's going to be there. Because love is a verb. We can say, especially at Christmas time, it's nice to say, well, I love my Christmas tree, and I love... Did Tyler, I forgot to throw those... those um, yeah, look at that. People go by there and go, wow, that's amazing. You know, we used to have a lighting contest in Williamsville. My wife entered it one year. She got third place. <laughs> do, do we still? Okay. But see, does that, does that make Christmas? Is that what, does that show love? I'm not saying you shouldn't decorate. You know, it's, if it was up to me, I wouldn't even put up a Christmas tree. Go ahead, call me Ebenezer if you want to, but that's okay. I, that doesn't mean Christmas to me. It's beautiful, it's lovely, it's wonderful, but if that got taken away and I didn't even put up a Christmas tree, guess what? Christmas still happens. And the reason is because that little boy was born in a manger in Bethlehem. And God showed love. It was a verb. He sent Christ to live in this world like you and I. To be tempted the same way that you and I are tempted. To be abused and put down and insulted like you and I get. But we have an example in him because he didn't give up. He took it to the very end. He completed his mission. He put love into action. And the reason that I know that you and I can do this, John 3, 16 and 17, you all know the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have, ever, have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That is what we can do and have Christmas every day. Because Christmas is not about receiving, but it's about giving. And sometimes that giving doesn't have a bow and fancy wrapping paper. Sometimes it comes in a pat on the back, a kind word, a tough word, but mostly it comes with love. And we've been given this warning in 1 John uh, chapter 4, 8 through 12, it says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We have an incredible opportunity, and if you think you're worthless, if you let people tell you that you don't matter, remember these words. 
that God chose you. He chose me. He chose us to be his children. But the choice whether to accept that gift is ours. It's not anybody else's choice. You can't blame anybody else for the things that happen in your life. You cannot blame anybody else for your lack of making a decision. The decision is yours and mine. Whether we accept the gift that God has presented us and live for him so that other people will look at us and go, hey, you know, I really like, you know, Bob, you seem to be able to get through circumstances without getting depressed all the way. Oh, yes, you get upset, but you don't, it doesn't stay with you. You, keep, you come out of it. Why? And you don't say, I don't say it's because I watch Dr. Phil or Oprah. It's because God loves me, and he has saved me, and he has given me a reason and a purpose to live. We're going to come before these emblems here in a minute as the worship team comes back. And by the way, I, I feel bad because I called Van Dan earlier. I'm sorry. Van, Van is, is, wor- is been substituting for, as our worship leader today. He's done a great job. But we're, we're going to come before these emblems, and we're going to remember. Because like with Christmas, what we do with these emblems is not just done one day a week. It's not just done one time a week. Because the sacrifice that we remember by taking these emblems is something that lives with us every day. And the great thing is, is that Jesus, yes, he died for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay a baby in a manger. He rose again. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming for us again. And the thing is, all we have to do is be ready. All we have to do is be ready. And so as we partake, remember that. Remember what was done for you and I. Remember that it was done not out of anything that we did, that we deserved, but out of the love that God has for each and every one of us, no matter who we are or what we do. Christ died for us, and he rose again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity again that we've had to worship you. I pray that your words spoke to our hearts, that we will leave this place not discouraged, but encouraged, that no matter the circumstances that we have to face this week, we know that you're there with us, that you love us, that you are, never fail or forsake us no matter what. We thank you for this Christmas time that we remember the birth of our Savior. But let us not leave that babe in the manger. Let us remember that he is now with you and he's coming back to take us home. But we need to make the decision whether or not we'll be ready to greet him. Father, forgive us when we do fail you. But thank you for this time that we can remember. Thank you for this time now as we gather around these emblems to remember the sacrifice that your son made. And so, Lord, we ask that you bless this time, you bless these folks as we go our separate ways, guide, guard, and direct them until we can meet together again. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the dark 
Christmas approaches the worship our God who sent his son into this world to save us. And we always on Christmas Eve have a Christmas Eve service to continue remind the reminder of what God did for us. So this Friday, 6 o'clock, we have our Christmas Eve service right here, or you can watch it online, to keep in mind, keep in our hearts, keep in our soul the gift God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's be praying as we close today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that greatest gift ever given, an unselfish, sacrificial gift of sending your son from home to become one of us, to live out a life showing us that you understand what we go through by him experiencing everything we go through and yet not sinning and then dying for our sins as the perfect sacrifice resurrecting from the dead, going home back to you, showing us we have the same thing, all because your son was born as a baby. So as we leave this place, help us to put on your son, to live out a life he has shown us by example, that all people may know what the truth is about Christmas. You giving us the greatest gift of all, our salvation through your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.